At T minus 31 seconds, the onboard computers take over the launch and we are go for auto sequence start. In the last few minutes, we have started the auxiliary power units, performed orbiter aerosurface and main engine gibble checks, retracted the gaseous oxygen vent arm, closed and locked our visors, initiated O2 flow, and transferred from ground to internal power. At T minus 16 seconds, the launch pad sound suppression system is activated, pouring over a million liters of water onto the launch pad in the flame trench. At T minus 10, there's a go for auto sequence start to start the main engines, which together burn almost 4,000 liters of propellant per second and produce over 500 tons of thrust, noise, and vibration. Three, two, one. Not what you're expecting, right? Me either. And when I was in the middle of my 20-year career as a NASA astronaut, I would never have expected that one day I'd be here talking to you not about the space shuttle or the space station, subjects that are near and dear to my heart, but about commercial space. The trajectory that led me here also started on a launch pad, not 39A or 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, but on Plashatka Nomaradin or pad number one, the appropriately named site from which Yuri Gagarin launched into history as the first human to orbit the Earth. And from which my crewmates and I launched on the Soyuz to the ISS. One of said crewmates was an Iranian-born American entrepreneur named Anusha Ansari. She was the fourth spaceflight participant, i.e. non-professional astronaut, to fly to the ISS. When asked by journalists what she hoped to achieve on the mission, she said, I hope to inspire everyone, especially young people, women, and young girls of all over the world to not give up their dreams but to pursue them. They may seem impossible to them at times, but I believe they can realize their dream if they keep it in their hearts, nurture it, look for opportunities, and make those opportunities happen. To be honest, I wasn't a big fan of, of the spaceflight participant program. I viewed space travel in general, and the ISS in particular, as a place for steely-eyed test pilots and scientists, not thrill-seekers with bloated wallets. But my 10 days in orbit with Anusha changed all of that. First of all, she was a consummate professional, doing her things carefully and accurately, but more importantly, through her blogs and other outreach efforts, she reached tens of thousands of people who previously had no interest in and no knowledge of human spaceflight. And I began to understand the concept of democratization of access to space, how a place that was once the domain only of governments could become reachable by individuals, indeed by school children who could one day launch payloads to space that they themselves developed. And so when the opportunity came to join the Commercial Spaceflight Federation, an advocacy organization dedicated to advancing the commercial spaceflight sector, I didn't hesitate. In my time working there with many companies that you've heard of, like SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, and many that you haven't, like Orbitech and Mast and Space Systems, I watched as the industry turned jeers to cheers and made believers out of naysayers. The IT-related advances in design and manufacturing techniques have allowed startups to play in the sandbox that was previously a domain only of state-run actors. Rockets are literally being built in garages and satellites in classrooms. And a veritable cottage industry of launch vehicles and spacecraft developers has sprung up across the United States. The free market forces of competition and efficiency have forever changed the landscape of access to and revenue from space. And the movement, dare I call it a revolution, is no longer only occurring in America. The wave of entrepreneurship and innovation has spread across the oceans and is now taking root in countries throughout Europe and Asia. Progressively smaller satellites with progressively larger constellations are making a very attractive market for launch vehicle companies all over the world to try to win by reducing cost and increasing flexibility. And so today, with great pride as a native Spaniard, I kick off this public announcement of a project by a Spanish company that's developing a technology that may well be the most disruptive yet in getting mass to orbit. 
For 58 years, we've been using chemical rocket engines on one end of a skinny cylinder to get the payload on the pointy part on the other end into space. That's about to change. And to explain how, I'd like to introduce the founder and CEO of Zero to Infinity, Jose Mariano Lopez Urdiales. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for making it here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to present uh, our project, Blue Star, or Shortcut to Orbit. You see, uh, for, for decades, uh, when, we're, when, we were being when we were launching things to space, uh, everybody would be looking up and seeing something, and now we're going to be seeing something different. Here at the ISC, we have, uh, we have uh, some other uh, members of the team. Um, there's Dimitris, uh, who's our COO, and there's Guillaume, who's uh, also a shareholder of the company, and he's been supporting us for, for years. And uh, since we are at the IAC and, and it's, it's like a family in a way, I, I wanted to go back a little bit in history to, to another IAC, the one that was happened in, in, in Barcelona in 1957. Um, and, well, here's, uh, here's some, some parts of some of the members of the team. Um, and, um, and before I go to 1957, uh, let me explain a little bit because sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. The company is called Zero to Infinity, and uh, we've been working on unmanned high altitude balloons. Uh, and that's the balloon project that you see down here on the left. And now we're developing also a next step in that more efficient transportation to the edge of space, and that's the Blue Star project. So it's the same team, but, uh, but for the moment, we've just been going to floating, skirming over the atmosphere, and we intend to go beyond that. So going back to, to the... Yeah, okay, okay sorry. Um, no, no, uh, it's your term, right? Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, I, I should have introduced uh, Guillaume. Uh, he's uh, he's now be talking, going to be talking a little bit more about the problem that we're trying to solve, and then I'll have a chance to go back to the ISC. I wanted so much to tell you about that, uh, but but yeah, I have to let uh, the rest of the team uh, do their part. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Jose. Actually, Jose gave me a quite an easy task to do today, because uh, I don't think there is a lot to say about the opportunity that there is regarding micro and nano satellite. So what we are aiming to do uh, with Blue Star is to unlock this new space revolution. We, we know that the traditional market on uh, satellite going from uh, one ton plus four ton, et cetera, is properly uh, answered with the conventional launchers. And uh, here at ISC, uh, since already a few years, you can see papers, company exhibitors, um, people who are trying to build up some micro and nano satellites. And that's exactly the market where we are, we are targeting. And the problem is that they all have one um, issue, is that there is no dedicated launcher for them. So what do they do? They go as a secondary payload on traditional rockets. So the rocket is there, the primary payload is rather heavy, and there is still a little bit of room inside under the fairing to host CubeSat, NanoSat, MicroSat. And so we would like to change this because there is a real potential in the industry and we, have, we would like to help reveal this um, fully. There are companies like Planet Lab who are aiming at providing high resolution picture every day of every places in the world. Company like OneWeb, um, who would like to provide internet for all, Spire for weather, and they all have a, the same problems. I guess you recognize this famous rocket, um, and we can all agree that uh, it hasn't changed too much. So the small satellite operator are facing several issues. I think the main one, in my opinion, is that they are not able to pick their own trajectory. As a secondary payload, they are brought, they are hitchhiking, and the primary payload is going in this direction when they want to go in that direction. That's the first issue. 
Then there is a lack of responsiveness. They, they're, it's not versatile or flexible, so you have to wait a lot of time before you get on board a launch. Uh, how can you build a, a constellation like that? I mean, the company I've just uh, talked about, they need hundreds of satellites, hundreds. So they won't be able to do it without a dedicated launcher. There is high risk, there is a cost problem, the complexity. And there is also one other issue that we are aiming at responding, is the volume. So we came up with some uh, different ideas and work a little bit on design thinking. And there is one thing about innovation that I like is there is always a debate of what is innovation. And one of my favorite quotes is that innovation is the capacity or ability to adapt to the change and anticipate it. So this is something that we all know and we've seen. And what I'd like to show here is that all along this curve, it's beautiful, it's very nice, um, the problem is that about 70% of the cost is actually burned during just to get there, just to get up there, about 20 kilometer high. And what we're doing with Blue Star is that we start there. Jose? Thank you so much, Guillaume. Um, so yeah, we, we're sending the rocket up on a balloon. And this is not a new idea. As I was saying before, in, in 1957, Sputnik was announced during the IAC in Barcelona. And a few months later, in the, in, in, in the Pacific, the US Air Force this, did, did this launch. Operation Farside, the Air Force Space Research Project based on Anuitok Island prepares for the launching of an ambitious stab into outer space via a rocket firing from a balloon at the height of some 19 miles. This the was is a light just between Explorer, sorry, rocket, Sputnik and Explorer, orbit, like the first Sputnik, Soviet satellite and the first American satellite. Attained, and radio its data back to Earth. Four previous attempts failed. You see the shape Defense of the rocket? Film show the fifth. It also it looks like the Tintin rocket. All the way. We'll get to that later. Purpose of firing from the balloon is to blast off in rarefied atmosphere at a height where air friction is at a minimum. Data obtained here will be of signal value both in the conquest of outer space and in America's development of an intercontinental missile. A height reached by the rocket, an estimated 4,000 miles. 4,000 miles. Man's farthest stride into outer space. Why that didn't continue? There's many reasons. But one is that the electronics were not there. That was ideal for payloads in the 100 kilogram regime. But with 100 kilograms of electronics of back then, you couldn't do much. Fast forward to the 21st century. That solution that was abandoned starts making a lot of sense. So let me show you now in color what we're doing. So this is a launch of ours. So it looks very similar to that video. It's in color and spherical. So we've, we've made some progress in, in video technology. And this is up the view up there, you see? OK, it's loading. See? So this is one video from, from our operations. Let's move on. So hey, here's the flight cycle of Blue Star. It's a three-stager, burning methane and oxygen. And we've done lots of analysis and found out that the sweet spot is between 20 and 25 kilometers of altitude. There's a, a parameter in, in rocket design called max Q. 
maximum dynamic pressure. It's really important in the design of a structure, the control system, the environment. And where we fly, maximum dynamic pressure is no longer an issue. It's like, like if, you, if there was no resistance from the atmosphere. Instead of fighting the drag of the air, fighting the atmosphere, and fighting gravity, we are playing with it. We are taking advantage of it through buoyancy getting out of the hardest part of the atmosphere. So the stages fall back to Earth, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the last stage puts the payload. This is how it looks. There are six engines on the first stage, six engines on the second stage, and one engine on the last one. And it doesn't look like a Tintin rocket, because it doesn't have to because there is, the drag is no longer an issue. And this shape has very, very interesting advantages. When folks design upper stages of launchers, they never make them thin and skinny uh, if they can. They, they make them something like this. These are the three stages. There is a fairing, but the fairing is, uh, is just protecting from the heat is not aerodynamic in, in purpose. So it, for those of you that, I don't want to do a spoiler for the movie uh, The Martian, but in that movie there is an instance of a fairing of, of this type. So I, I'll just leave it there for you guys when you see it, that you'll recognize something related to these kinds of, the, of fairings. And you see we put here a concept satellite, but it's a really big one. Because the environment of the launch is more benign than the environment of a launch that is going in a hypersonic regime through the atmosphere. You do have vibrations, but they come from the engines. They don't come from the, from the shaking with the, with the atmosphere. So you can have something bigger. How does it launch? Well, it will launch from the sea. Why? Because of cost. The cost of a range, the cost of a ranch by the coastline is a very significant cost that doesn't scale down properly. Like, the cost of the propellant scales down properly. If you're launching a smaller rocket, you use less propellant, and the propellant is a commodity that you buy. The cost of materials is similar. But there are other costs that don't scale properly. One of them is the range. If you, if you have to own a ranch or rent a ranch by the sea, or if you have to own an airplane, that, that's a pretty expensive thing to own. On the contrary, we can just take our ISO containers, put them on a flat boat, and have the boat move exactly at the same speed as the wind. And that's how it launches. So this is an artist's conception. We're not going to be shooting through the balloon, by the way. We, that's been done. It's because it's a very useful thing to have a balloon there. Basically, the balloon, when it drops the payload, it goes up higher. It's like you threw away some ballast stabilizes at a higher altitude, and it can be used as a, as a telecommunications relay as a, for your telemetry. Because from the boat where the mission control is, you lose line of sight at a certain point. But the balloon can provide you that extended line of sight during the launch. So this is how it goes. This, again, is an artist's conception. It opens up. The, the, the fairing is attached to the first stage only, because uh, it, it only needs to be protected through that period of the flight. It separates. It's going to be fun to see those stages coming back down because uh, they, they're going to have a much more benign environment also coming back down compared to something that looks pointy and, and skinny. So who knows? We might even be able to re recover this and refurbish them. It's not part of our business plan, but at least uh, it's a lot easier to recover a toroid. Actually, it's, a, it's an ideal reentry shape than it is uh, to recover a cylinder, which is one of the most difficult shapes to, to get back in a reentry. So here's the payload at the end. And I would like to pass it on to Dimitris, or COO, uh, to, to, to explain a little bit the advantages for the market, why this solution, why this technical exotic solution actually has a lot of benefits that can be translated to our customers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mariano. Mr. 
sometimes it's very graphical, but I think it deserves to be summarized and, and gathered all together because the, 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 the weak points that we have seen and our colleague um, Guillaume has explained are more or less like the opposite um, list of what we have um, identified. We have a higher engine efficiency, mainly because we are going to uh, design and operate in one single regime, almost a vacuum uh, environment that will transfer to us uh, better capabilities in order to improve and focus and make more efficient improvements in that single uh, regime. Regarding the safety, uh, we consider that our solution increased in the safety. The risk zero doesn't exist, but as he has commented, the boat, an isolated area, not linked with any population, far away for the human beings, the possibility to abort the mission during the lift stage of the balloon around 90 minutes transferred to us more control in order to monitorize the status of all the variables that are is transferred uh, to the safety. Or the selection, we visualize an environment where the clients for the first launch and for the replacement of the constellation are gonna request to us dedicated spots through uh, the space, we consider that with that capability, we are going to be able to select in a proper way the right orbit. Regarding the external condition, the weather, the weather is always a constraint. We have minimized to the maximum that constraint due to we have the possibility to move once we have selected the right uh, location, the boat, in order to escape to any storm. We also have the possibility to control the wing, which is more or less the weak point in our service, thanks to the boat, in order to minimize any kind of turbulence during the lifting stage. So that is an asset of the, of the proposal. Less capital intensive. I'm not thinking yet in the, in the propeller or in the fuel, that is probably the, the first intuition. There is a lot of engineering stages that we are avoiding. Thanks to that, we are starting the problem at 25, 20 kilometers. There are a lot of analysis, there are a lot of uh, technical um, details that are not needed more in our system. For sure that we will have to postpone that for the second and the third stage, but that introduced a very interesting approach for, for the capital and for the cost. We are also introducing a cost reduction because in our view, in all the analysis that we have done, Many of the elements that we have introduced in the solution are already existing in the market. We are designing with a different approach a puzzle with pieces that already exist in, a pieces that in many cases has economy and scale that we have the possibility to include in our own business plan. The usability in the current momentum is always a reference that has been taken in consideration. It's not included so far right now in our business plan, but it is included seeing the roots in the design of the shape. The design of the shape is optimized for the reusability and all the process that we have gathered in order to define which is gonna be our roadmap, we have taken in consideration that reusability must be a must uh, so far. And the environmentally responsible, we are using helium. We are trying to preserve as much as possible in this stage where you don't talk about the cost, but the consumption and the also the impact in the environment is, is very high. There is another, and probably it's the more valuable asset for the market topic that we would like to explain in more detail. We are creating an amazing platform for the future satellite providers, for the future communication providers in order to maximize, which is currently the bottleneck, the area, the surface, and the volume. All the potential users that we can imagine right now and that will raise uh, sooner or later are related mainly to the surface. Radiators, they require to be maximized in order to radiate the head. All the reference with the solar panels, as much as possible, as bigger as possible. Antennas, optics, if we want to maximize the resolution for Earth observation so in all those cases, what we are transferring to our clients is a platform where the volume and the surface is huge. Two times the maximum volume, two times the maximum surface that is right now available 
in a market that is running like in a fast track in order to transfer to the final users one specific solution in order to launch the micro and nano satellites. That is a platform that we consider that is able to be transferred to the market with a half price to the better price that right now is surrounding the inexisting market. For sure, we are going to be linkage with the satellite product producers. We are going to be linkage with the market because what we have identified is if we design in advance, taking in consideration the requirements and all the topics that the final users are going to request, yeah, talking about the telco environment or the air observation, we are going to transfer to the satellite producers an amazing environment in order to also improve their own business. Um, I share to my CEO also. Well, th thank you, Dimitris. Um, so this is this is what I, we wanted to tell you, and, and now we have some time for questions. Um, I, I hope you find this entertaining and interesting, and, and we'll we'll be happy to to follow up with with all your questions uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you for this really great presentation. Um, Jean-Dominique from Abbasifat in Space. I just have two questions. Um, what is the maximum mass that you can upload? And can you uh, have several payloads at a time? Yeah, the, the maximum is around 150 kilograms. And you can have several payloads uh, with several standard attachments. Thank you. I would like to, to announce that during our presentation, our web it was in a countdown stage, but most probably right now, uh, bluestar.com is the portal where we are going to update all the information so it will be available. Uh, what is the targeted specific cost of the payload, please, at Leo? What is the targeted specific cost of, of the payload at Leo? Cost, yeah, uh, a cost. Uh, well, the, the, the we, cost. Can, we can put it simply, uh, how much it costs to, to launch Okay. And then we have the weight, right? Yeah, the, the cost uh, per, per flight is, is four, 4 million euro, which is about half of what the other dedicated launchers in the market are proposing. Thank you. I just want to add one thing regarding the cost, which is probably quite important, is there is a current reference in the market about the weight. That's true, and that's, that's the reality. But we would like to be a game changer also by changing this, pers this perception. Not only a cost per weight, but also a cost per surface. Because if people are flying with us, basically that change the way they are building their satellite. And that's where I'm addressing to you if there are any uh, small satellite manufacturer. If you know that you can uh, come on board with us and you have more volume for your satellite, then you have the possibility to Increase the size of your solar array panel, your radiator, and uh, your antenna, for instance. The size of your, the lenses of your equipment. I think Dimitri approached that point. And that's quite important because that changed the way you're going to do it and the life of your satellite when it's going to fly. So we'd like to use maybe a cost per surface rather than a cost per, um, per weight. Uh, hello, Ben Kawak. Just a quick question. With your current business plan, do you have enough funding to manufacture the first two or three launches? And if yes, when do you expect to have your first launcher ready? Well, I'll actually just uh, make one thing. I mean, I'll let uh, Jose uh, answering after that. But I think one of the ideas, you know, we're uh, here at the ISC and the IAF. Um, we, this is a big family and we really appreciate being here. One of the important things for us is to be recognized, memorized, and that our project is taking off also by the recognition that we are having here. So regarding the funding, we have um, um, made a lot of efforts in the private sector. And uh, if Jose, you would like to, uh, to add more on this, I just want to say that what is important for us is that you talk about this project and uh, that it's uh, now become uh, more renowned. 
Um, so about the funding, um, you might be curious. We, we have 25 investors from Hong Kong, France, Germany, and Spain, including Spain's third largest bank, who owns 8% uh, of the company. And uh, several of, of these investors can, can actually provide all the funds required. They have that capability. So, so we've raised uh, the funds that we needed to get to this point, uh, basically to carry on man payloads. And, and, and we are we're confident that that's, that's not going to be an issue. Thank you. Hi, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this. Do you have a, any customers that have already signed, and when do you expect that you conduct your first launch? We are running the business for the suborbital. We have already clients that request to us any kind of drop test, any kind of uh, trial with our current uh, capability. Uh, we have a detailed work plan in order to assure that every quarter we are able to uh, start testing what Blue Star introduced, that second uh, stage. Our aim, the most uh, accurate uh, uh, estimation transfer that mid-2018 should be the first orbital flight for that purpose and objective we will require uh, a cascade of previous tests and we have included in our business plan at least four previous orbital uh, flights before a, a, commercial, a commercial one. The first trial should be uh, according to our plan uh, with the first stage making possible at least to reach the 100 kilometer barrier uh, during the, the first quarter, second quarter of 2016, so in six months. Um, let, let me add that uh, we have uh, customers from seven countries that have signed letters of intent uh, on different terms and, um, and uh, of course uh, some of those may transform into contracts uh, if, if we meet a certain number of milestones along the program. So we've, we've identified and validated our design and our mass points and so on and pricing with, uh, with customers from seven countries. And, and the total of all the letters of intent uh, is, uh, if you add it all up, it's uh, 198 million. It's likely that some of those customers have also written such letters of intent to other suppliers uh, in the in the suborbital, sorry, in the in the in the microsatellite launcher market. But uh, there is, uh, there is, for us, it's enough validation of the market uh, needs. Thank you. And as he said, we do have customers, and we've flown payloads for customers of the unmanned business. Sorry, the, of the of the high altitude balloon uh, business. The total budget to develop the program uh, is, is, not, is not public, but it's uh, significantly less than, than what, be, what, what we consider um, that would be required if we had to develop, for instance, the turbo pumps and we had to buy an airplane and so on. So, so it's, uh, as he said, as, as Dimitri said, it's less capital intensive, but that's not public information. Do you have any uh, issues with the uh uh, thermal issues, having so many engines clustered together, and also what's the total burn time of the upper stage engine? The, the total burn time of the upper stage engine, and are there any thermal issues with so many engines clustered together? Uh, the, the burn times uh, of, of the engines, yeah. you mean? Uh, the, of, the, of the last one, uh, the, there are several firings of it, so total burn times is uh, it's, it's several hundreds of seconds, uh, almost a thousand seconds. It depends on the orbit, actually. It depends on the, on the type of orbit. And the first question was? Yeah, are there any thermal issues, having so many engines clustered together? Uh, um, uh, there, there's plenty of experience in, therm in, 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 these kinds of, uh, in these kinds of engines, and you have to see that our, our engines are burning at much lower pressure than conventional engines. So there is actually less thermal radiation that you would expect, and, and it's expanding into vacuum. So, so the, the first part is cooled by, is regeneratively cooled, and then the, the last part of the, of the nozzle is, is just uh, cooled by radiation. There's a, a tremendous amount of surface per engine compared to the conventional launcher because you have these big skirts because you want to take advantage of the, of the vacuum. So that helps you a lot with the, with the thermal 
And will you be Im li limited by upper level wins for the release? Yes, there's definitely wins up there. The thing is, the whole vehicle moves with those winds. So what you have to do, the, like a lot, this is a very common concern about uh, folks when they hear about high altitude ballooning is, oh, but the winds are very high up there, how are you going to do that? Well, they're very strong, but they're very stratified. They are very, they, they're not turbulent, the winds, once you get to those altitudes. So the whole mass of the balloon and the payload is moving at that speed. Okay. And it's an, a speed that is not an unknown. It's but, very well known. But how, so, do, you, but how do you point it? How do you point it? Stop it twisting. You're right. Uh, we've run many models of this. Uh, you know, having a torque, having one engine failing and so on. Basically, um, if, if you want to see a living proof of something similar, you can look at the SpaceX uh, pad aboard launch that had eight engines being fired at once without a whole release system and see how beautifully it performed on the first time. So this is a solved problem. It's a control problem, but it's a solved problem. In our case, we intend to have several gimbals uh, and also their engines are slightly throttable. I wouldn't say they're deep throttable, but they are slightly throttable. And with the combination of the gimbaling and the throttability, uh, you, can, you can correct. Basically, one engine, uh, we have a one engine out capability, and the way this works is that you've got the six engines, and if one is not operating well, you turn it off, and you turn off the opposite one, so, uh, so it can compensate and, and, and just do the, the flight. Um, so this is, it, it, it's an issue, but it's, uh, it's an issue that, that we are aware of, and, and, and it's totally solvable within current technology. I just wanted to add one thing regarding the, the complexity and the type of engines. I don't know if, we, um, if that was really clear when we showed the, the cycle, but basically we have uh, what I like to call the zero stage with the balloon, and then a three-stager launcher. But the, to answer your question, gentlemen, is um, regarding the complexity and the, the capital that is needed for, for this project. It's much less capital intensive, as Jose said, because we basically have the same type of engine for all, this, for all the, the measures. During the life cycle, stage three, two, and one are using basically uh, a similar technique. Yeah. So the question is, uh, it's from me. So the question is, is your platform scalable? So can, will you be able to do a bigger launchers afterwards with the bigger balloons and bigger engines? Um, the answer is yes. Um, the, 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 record of alti the, the record of payload hanging from one of those uh, zero pressure balloons is around 12 tons. So our whole stack is, is way below that. So, so definitely with, with existing balloons and, and existing uh, trials that have been done in the past, uh, we, we could grow, this, uh, have, have a larger version. Uh, the thing is that at the moment we, we don't see that need in the market, but, but uh, it can, uh, it's the same ba basic technologies and, and we would still be, the, be within the state of the art of, of high altitude balloon launches. Uh. Yeah, I have a question on whether uh, you have a specific season for the launch of the balloon, like we do when we launch stratospheric balloon, when you, you wait for the inversion of the upper winds. In particular, if you want to recover some of the elements, or you will be able to launch at all time? Um, we, we can launch at, at most conditions. Uh, there are some conditions in which the tropopause, which is the coldest part of the atmosphere, you know, the temperature goes down as you go up, and then it goes up again. Mm -hmm. So there is that place when it's really cold, um, if there's a combination of a certain amount of crosswinds and low temperatures, you wouldn't be able to, to go through that. But in the Canary Island area where we're looking, and from, on all those uh, patches of, of sea, the chances of not, us not being able to go through that are, are very, very small. So, so we, we're not that, that concerned. We're, we're working with, um, with the meteorologist that used to be the head meteorologist of CNES uh, for the high altitude balloon program, Pierre de Dieu, and, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's been great to, to count on him. I mean, there's a, 
as you saw the picture, there's a young team of professionals, highly motivated, but we are also extremely um, uh, thankful to count on, on the experience of, uh, of a group of uh, more experienced professionals uh, from different space programs and different companies that, that are, have been advising us and making all this possible, otherwise we wouldn't know where to start. Thank you, Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Um, could you describe your engines a little bit, uh, where you are in the development of them and where you're getting them? Sure, um, the, the engines um, are burning methane and oxygen. Uh, we talked to several vendors and decided to just hire talent and develop them ourselves for many reasons. And we've uh, fired several engines uh, it's been instrumental for us to count, with, uh, to count on uh, a company called Ultra Magic, which is the largest manufacturer of hot air balloons in the world. And you might wonder, what does a hot air balloon have to do with this? Because you're flying a gas balloon and, well, a hot air balloon is essentially a, a device that burns propane. And a rocket that is burning methane is not that different, you know, in conceptual. I mean, at least you have to have storage facilities, you have to have valves, you have to have uh, pipes and, and material compatibility issues and so on. So we've been, we've been taking advantage of all their knowledge and the equipment and their licenses to, to fire, make, make, make big shows and big fires to, 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 kick, to start. So of course we, we, we still haven't tested it in vacuum, which will be a step at some point. And, um, but uh, we are, yeah, we're relying, as I said, uh, with, on, on existing experts and try to develop a lot of these things in house. Uh, we feel that um, even though there's knowledge about these things, of course, and methane engines have been developed in other places, um, our engine is so simple and so, and, and yeah, and, and, and with so little complexity that, that we, we don't gain too much from relying on a vendor and we would much rather have that in-house. And also 3D printing is a really promising technology and we are all on an equal footing on that. There are no, like, there are no, no experts really on this. We are all trying these things for the, t for the first time to see how, how you can 3D print uh, these engines. It's regeneratively cooled, okay? So there's little tubes inside to keep it from, from melting and having it lightweight. Could, could you comment on the performance, both for the large engines and then the smaller ones on the second stage? Um, uh, I can tell you the thrust, uh, the little, um, the second stage and third stage uh, uh, share the same engines and they, they do two, two kilonewtons. And on the, six, uh, the, the first stage has six engines of 15 kilonewton uh, maximum thrust. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the ISP is a typical ISP of methane oxygen at, at, at those altitudes and in vacuum. Thank you, Mark Schaefer uh, from SpaceWorks in the United States. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, so you're using oxygen and methane. Are those stored cryogenically in I, the I tanks? Think, yeah, they, they, are, they are stored cry, cryogenically, yeah. Liquid, so um, I saw on an earlier chart that you have a 90 minute ascent time um, up to 20 kilometer altitude. That's a pretty challenging environment for cryogenic propellants. Do you, um, do you expect any problems with thermal management and propellant boil off there? Yeah, we, we've, we've looked at that. There's, there's two problems that, that are really, really important that you have to take care of. One is boil off, um, uh, especially during the day. And the other one is uh, condensation of water. So uh, we've, those, are, those are both problems, but they're both solvable issues. And, and we, we're working on, on, on those. Um, basically, the boil off, actually, when you calculate the amount that, that you, you do have is, is relatively small. Um, and it, so, so we looked into having tanks, extra tanks to top off that boil off, but it wasn't worth it. 
it, it, it really wasn't worth it. There, there wasn't even a, even launching in the middle of the day, it, it, because that you anyway have a certain amount of insulation, and and you have to have those kinds of insulations and, and coatings and such uh, to prevent uh, ice buildup on the way up. But that's um, that's doable, and, and it's a, it's an issue that that um, that you would also have uh, on other types of rockets and. And it's, it's a solved problem. I myself worked on the, in Creos Pass, which is the company that makes the cryogenic tanks for the Ariane 5, uh, which are a lot tougher because they're hydrogen. And so, so even though my, my heart first uh, wanted to go to hydrogen, uh, in the end we, we decided to be more reasonable and, and go with methane because it's, it's, uh, it's a lot easier. And you can have a common, bulk held, common bulk heads because the temperature are similar with, with the oxygen. And it's cheaper. Yes, Philippe Wilkins from ESA. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate you and uh, encourage every one of you because I think you, you've got the right model there. You, you've got the right approach. You, you've got the right people around the table. Um, one question, though, maybe one recommendation. Um, the question is, of course, you, you've got, well, Frank was addressing the engines and we have several questions on the engines, so obviously you're not at the end of the road there, although your disruptive approach could be also applied to how can you challenge the, the calendar as well? I mean, how can you go faster than the other? And it seems that you're going to follow the same route to some by repeating some of the um, uh, analysis that you need to do on these engines. Is there any way you guys can, can find a, a, the right partner for these engines uh, so that you can accelerate the process and really gain time? Because uh, I, would, I would really like to, to see you very shortly here in, uh, after your first um, you know, uh, orbit and, and, and report to that. that. I think the whole crowd will be very different uh, once you have something already proven. Uh, also, I'm, I'm curious to see what is the technology you're using for your fairing. I mean, I've seen the drawing there. It looks like a, uh, you know, a very specific uh, way to open up the, um, the fairing. So that, I, I feel a little, uh, a little surprised, but maybe there's also innovation there. But all those are questions I'm sure you're going to look at. My, my two points is first, congratulations, keep going. We need guys like you. Second, uh, technology maybe find the right partner so you can accelerate and get the edge over the other one. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, encouragement. It's really appreciated. Um, I just wanted to uh, answer, uh, maybe just address one thing regarding the engine. Uh, we are in the process of um, doing a few demonstrators and um, to accelerate the pass, indeed, we have the possibility to in take some, some engines that are on the shelf and already produce. So I think the point that Sir Jose has made regarding the fact that we would like to develop um, those engines ourselves as well are to reduce the cost and secondly to, to keep our competitive advantage. We are, I think, um, in, a, in a right tempo to do it. One of the things is that we, you haven't heard maybe about Blue Star before because we've been working on it and uh, we, we just now talk about it. So we hope that hopefully very soon uh, we'll have our first demonstrator flying. And uh, Jose, if you would like to talk about maybe the fairing, that's uh, more your part. Yeah, well, thank you again. I, I really appreciate it. I, I wish uh, ESA, um, as a policy, not just yourself, uh, also supported a commercial space like uh, maybe 5% of what NASA is doing. That would be a game changing for Europe. Um, the, um, the fairing is a uh, beta cloth, basically. It's, um, it's, uh, it's fiberglass coated with, with Teflon, uh, multi-layer. So it's, um, it's like high temperature cloth, because that's really what you want. You just want to, you don't want the vapors from the shockwave uh, going into, the, into the, the satellite during that first phase. So it's, uh, it's flexible, it's, it's cloth. And it's got some ribs and um, so that's, uh, that's our concept. Of course, we have to try it, but, but it's very simple. And, and yeah, I mean, uh, recently we saw NASA providing a contract to Firefly Rocket Lab and Virgin Galactic, even though all these companies uh, are in, in, in development, let's say. 
and uh, and it would be it would be amazing if if those kinds of things happened in in Europe where we have uh, tremendous companies like S3 for instance that that are as far as I know like lacking that sort of uh, support uh, from from our institutions. Yeah, I, let me just piggyback on to that. Um, I, as I mentioned in my open, I'm I'm very passionate about this idea of commercialization of access to space and. It's true that NASA has been very wise. Obviously, their investment in commercial cargo, commercial crew programs have, has been substantial. But um, it, there seems to be, although there are companies sprouting up in Europe and elsewhere, uh, it's a bit of a vacuum here in terms of leadership. And it's a, it's a space that's dying to be filled. So you have a lot of bright people with a lot of great ideas. And it just takes a little bit of uh, encouragement from the regulatory standpoint and most of all from institutions because in Europe people listen to institutions and that sort of backing it doesn't have to be a significant financial backing but just an endorsement from an, an organization like ESA would go a very very long way and I don't mean just for this company but for any company that's uh, trying to, to be game-changing and groundbreaking. Yes, to finish, uh, I'd like to thank to everybody for staying here, for support, for visualize that, okay, it's a complex track, but we are really, really encouraged in order to follow our dream that is coming through. You will see, as I have commented, the web is already uh, available with news and updates that we are going to uh, keep transferring to, to you, please. Enroll and you will receive the newsletter. You also will see, for those that are all over the world and mainly for the young professionals that are aiming to, to be involved in projects like this. We, we are transferring to them three job descriptions already available in, in the web. So read it carefully and let's try to increase the team and make bigger the Barcelona space and hub. Thank you very much for, for your time and we are in contact.